Okay, episode 24. I'm not in the office. I'm in the lobby of a hotel. I'm sitting on the ground. That's how we do it. I've got Matt Perry, the good crisp. Good dude, by the way. I've got Yuval Selleck, promo mash. We'll get into that at the end. Matt, let's talk chips. Yeah. Let it start. Who started it? What was the idea behind it? Give it to us. For sure. So I started about uh, five, six years ago in Australia. Um, so I've always been in CPG, had a, a company where we imported people's brands and sold them into Australia. So it's always been my background. I've always done it for other people, but wanted to do it for myself, just sort of was waiting for the right idea and, and the right time to come along. Um, and sort of was struck because I was on a fairly strict gluten-free diet, cutting out a lot of allergens, things like that. And salty snacks is my, my, my biggest weakness and, and wanted to, you know, typical story, wanted to find a healthier version that fit in with my diet. Couldn't find one um, when it came to sort of the stack chip side of things. Looked around, realised that there wasn't one, realised that there was hardly anybody making it around the world and, you know, your entrepreneurial sort of hair starts rising and thinking, hey, this is, this is really interesting, this is difficult, therefore there might be an opportunity. And so I happened to, from my, my business in Australia, know a manufacturer that was one of the, the best in the world and, and because we'd worked together for a long time, we were able to uh, develop a product and, and work on the, the flavourings to make it taste amazing but take all the nasty stuff out. So, um, yeah, that's sort of how it happened. Now, let's talk uh, presentation. Was it always in the canister? Folks, check it out if you haven't already. Uh, it does resemble something that you may know from childhood. At least I do. I'm sure, uh, sure Matt, you, you, you got the vibe there. Was it always in a canister style? Was that the idea marketing-wise? Yeah, it yeah. was It was very simple. I wanted to just make a Pringles, a canister chip that um, I felt good eating and I felt good giving to my kids. They were sort of, the, and, and they would feel happy eating as well. I mean, you're, you're in, in Snacks Mark, you understand it has to taste good. So find something that, you know, wasn't going to be super nuanced, wasn't going to be some, you know, really hardcore seaweed keto snack that I'd try and give my kids. This was just something that removed as many barriers as possible. So it looked the same, it tasted the same, if not better, but I just felt uh, less guilty about giving it to my kids and they felt happy to eat. So, you know, we're unashamedly sort of in, in that middle. I see myself as a, a mass natural sort of product and just helping everyday Americans feel good about the snacks they're eating. Uh, that's really what we're focusing on. Well, and Australians too, right? I mean, and, you're not going to <laughs> um, Taste is important, everyone. Uh, I've, I, when we started, I have stories for you. Uh, if you're building something for the long haul, you got to have a product that tastes good. It's the same as if you're in services and selling a product. It's got to be a good service. It's got to be one that has value. Uh, Matt, walk us through the first few years. Uh, go year to year. Give us like the, the big takeaway from each of the first few years. So my first few years we launched in Australia and, and that was that was tough to be frank. We sort of didn't get traction in the, in the major supermarkets. There's only two uh, major sort of grocery chains in Australia and they were really in bed with, with uh, the majors um, and so we, we couldn't really get in there. They didn't really want us and so we're doing a lot of you know, um, which, which wasn't necessarily bad. It just was a little frustrating at the time, but we were doing 7-Elevens. We, we ended up getting on all the airlines. We were doing school canteens, things like that. So it did teach me the value of those other sort of alternative businesses. But um, really, that was sort of, we couldn't get the scale. Then I came across to uh, Expo West, sort of two years into it, and just saw all of these American um, natural grocers that, you know, like natural grocers, like Whole Foods, like Sprouts, that didn't have any canister chips in them, that, that wanted our product. And for me, that was the big sort of aha moment where I thought, why am I banging my head up against um, people that don't want this product when there's a whole group of people that do? And so I started to focus on that. And, and really for us, that's been... Um, one of the leaders of, of and, and it's really helped explode with, with our growth, is, is sell where we're actually wanted and, and go to that sort of area there. And, and so that um, facilitated really the, the move to the US market sort of fairly early on, even though 
it was a big step. I realized sort of there's actually heaps more potential here because people want our product. It wasn't about, oh, America's so big, there's so much opportunity. It was more about the consumer and what they wanted. And I saw there was a bigger need there. I mean, now a few years on, we, we sell back in Australia. We're in the major grocery chains, but um, you know, it took us a couple of years. That, that's a nice takeaway. Um, you do need to test markets. Um, again, if we were starting small, I always talk a little bit about regional plays. You know, I have a product. I want to test it. I, I don't have a lot of money. Go into a local supermarket. Go into 10 that are in your neighborhood. Start there. Get some data. Get some feedback. And you're touching on go to where the demand is going to be. You know, as a, as a, as a founder and entrepreneur, you, you, you sometimes get so, so tightly wound, so, so bound to something or an idea. The reality is it's the consumer who's going to build your brand, right? Uh, and you need to find out who is that going to be, what do they look like, and then double in on that. Um, and that's hard, that's hard for, 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 for people like us. Um, let's fast forward a bit, but were you raising money? Um, Cause it, it for, started in 14, correct? Yes. Were you raising money, let's say from 14 to 18? And if so, was it friends and family? How much do you think you, you needed to raise? <laughs> Yeah, so we, uh, for the first few years, um, we, I used our existing business. We used our existing business in Australia to sort of fund the cash flow in, into this sort of product here. So we were able to, to go a fairly decent way without needing funds to start with or to go to friends and family. Um, because, you know, as you talk about, Mark, it's very expensive to start a, a CPG business. It's even more expensive one to start one over the other side of the world and, and the volumes are a lot higher. So thankfully, we were able to sort of draw on that. It got big enough where... The, the Good Chris Company is now a standalone business. We're an American company and we sort of didn't have that lifeline that we could keep sort of bleeding dry a little bit back in back in Australia. So then we started to, to raise money. And for us, it was a conscious choice of um, do, we, do we sort of keep going small and let this thing grow organically? And there's nothing wrong with that. But my fear was we have a great product. We're unique. We're the first to market. Um, and we're getting really good response. We're sort of getting a lot of retailers asking for us. I want to grow with that scale and get out there and get sort of ex, um, focus our first to market advantage, which is not always relevant to other products. But we thought, considering you know there was just no other real canister chips doing what we were doing, we wanted to get out early. So I made the choice to um, take some money. So we've we've um, had some investors. Circle Up was one of our early investors. Did a big convertible note with us. Um, they've continued to invest in us and we've brought in other sort of um, industry experts and founders as, as well to, to invest. And we've raised, to be frank, over $5 million over the last couple of years to, to continue to, to drive our business and in particular at the moment to help with cash flow in, in this crisis. He said five mil. Yeah. He said five mil, folks. <laughs> it is an expensive business. Um, I love the idea of being able to start small, you know, get $10,000, $20,000, test something. And the, for those that are in the, the thick of this, it's expensive. There's just the thing, even if you are running the company lean, you know, for us, we, we have five or six team members, right? It's five or six of us. And I, and I love that. Um, and then there's the flip side. You can, you can build out a, a huge organization. Uh, there is the unknowns of just distributors. I mean, even if you, even if you have decent margins, there's just distributors, there's promotions, there's things that happen at retail level, there's merchandising, um, for you to play in the space and scale, uh, you need money. Um, and so that's just a, it's a takeaway and, you know, I touch on it a lot. Um, it, 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 if you really are trying to make a move in the, in the category, you do need money. And more than you think you need. Huh? And more than you think you oh, need. It's, I, yeah, the, my, my running joke is it's I, I, how much do you need? You need five times more than you thought. Oh, and then you need five times more than that. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, Matt, bring us um, current a little bit about retail here domestically. What are your three or four core uh, main uh, retailers? Yep. So um, certainly some of our main, it's actually, we, we play in both ends of the spectrum. So our two biggest and main retailers are Whole Foods. So we're national with, with Whole Foods there. We've got two, we've got another two SKUs going in our uh, next few months. So that's a big, big retailer for us. And then on the other side, Walmart is our second biggest uh, retailer there. And we're nationally with them in about 4,000 stores in their gluten-free 
set there. Um, and so going back to that sort of point around wanting to be a, a mass natural one, we can still sell in, in both of, of those and, and we work really well. And I really you know, think there's a, a customer for us in both of those stores. So they're our sort of two anchors. And then we sort of predominantly deal in, in the natural channel. So we're in most sort of natural grocery stores. Um, and then, you know, we sit on those edges. But we are moving more into conventional Wegmans, HEB, hy um, <clears throat> you know, sort of out into some of those other sort of conventional areas. We're taking that slowly, to be frank. We're not... We're not necessarily desperate. We're in about eight or 9,000 retailers at the moment, and that's okay for us. Um, it's more about now going deeper and more flavours and more products with them and then just testing out exactly what we did at the start. You know, to your point, we're now doing for conventional. Find a, a region or two, go in there, learn, do some marketing, get our numbers out, learn what works before we start sort of rolling out into conventional. So that's our focus for the rest of this year and next year. Very cool. And that's big. I mean, that's, you know, congratulations. Eight or 9,000 stores is really amazing. Um, awesome. And um, let's talk about the channel that you desire to be in. Like, give us that, that, Mm, that's the one that, that I think we would do very well in. You may not even be in it yet, and you have sort of a strategy to get there. Is there one that comes to mind? For, for us, that is that is the conventional channel. For, for us to be the number two canister chip brand in the US, which is our company uh, sort of focus, we need to we need to perform strongly and continue to perform strongly in natural. That's really really important. That's our 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 lifeblood to some degree. But you know, as I keep coming back to it, our product is is not a standalone whole foods product. We we, we want to be sold in those areas. I think there's just as many, and we know from the research we've done, there's just as many parents that shop at Safeway and Kroger and all of that that want to buy our product as well. It's just. It's a, it's a different game. There's different rules. There's different table stakes. So we, we need to understand that and learn from that. So there's, as I said, there's not a hurry, but we know that we need to be there and, and we've got some plans around that. Love it. Um, let's talk next 12 months. Um, uh, little caveat, Matt and I uh, know each other because we're, we've kind of been uh, grooving on this. What, what do we call that? A little... Uh, a little Friday mastermind, mastermind Friday group. Yeah, oh, mastermind. Uh, I, was, I was lucky enough. Uh, Matt asked me, and so um, and people are like, "Wait, but aren't you in the same category?" Yeah, sort of. I mean, we're in better for you. We the, the functions of the product are a little bit different, um, but you can get around good people. Um, you you find a, 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 a good um, man or woman in the category or even in um, categories similar and just start jiving with them. You know, there's a lot of really good information out there um, that's helpful. Sorry, let me get back to this. Matt, next 12 months, uh, give it to us. What do, you, what do you think that looks like for the Good Crisp? For us, um, it's trying to get back on track after COVID. So COVID's been good in some regards, but also it's put a big pause on, on a lot of us. We've got a lot of great flavours, a lot of things that we're looking to launch and get out there that's sort of been put on uh, pause a little bit. So for us to say, it's not necessarily chasing new distribution over the next 12 months, though we have some good things lined up, which we're excited about for uh, next year but mainly about just going deeper, making sure that we have, you know, five, six SKUs. We've got that whole shelf. We're executing on off locations. We've got great promotional programs is sort of key for us. And then sort of internally as well, like a lot of people, tightening up our costs, making sure our margins are strong, you know, keeping ourselves efficient, using our capital wisely. So it's not, no big haymakers, so to speak, but just, you know, executing a lot more carefully and then going a lot deeper with the places we're at. I love it, man. Few SKUs, tighten up margin, align yourself with the right retailers, yep. buttoning it all <laughs> up. It's all the good stuff, man. Uh, congrats. Uh, I know you're a good, you're a good dude. So um, I want nothing but the best for you. Uh, you've all, let's talk promo mash. What are we That's talking so about here? What are we talking about here? Give it to us. All give right. it to, I'll give, give it to you. I'll give you the elevator pitch, a quick one, so not to uh, take too much time because I'm known for talking a lot. Ask my partner. Uh, but Promesh, uh, we're a software and service company uh, for emerging CPG brands to run their sales and marketing promotional efforts on one platform. So you can imagine, as we spoke and you spoke with Matt about trade. Uh, merchandising, demos, these are all tactics as part of your second largest spend as a company. Other than cost of goods, 
getting into retail and succeeding in retail is really expensive. And that's where you need to just keep on getting more money and more money because you, it's almost like you're an ATM machine. The brokers want more, more support. The retailers want more support. The distributors want more support. And they're just going to ask you until you say no. So because of that, what we've created, and we started with demos, merchandising, and field marketing events five years ago, but we transitioned into the full spectrum of trade. So basically, we're one database, one platform that allows every team within a CPG brand to work together off of the same information. So whether you're doing demos, whether you're doing merchandising, whether you're doing uh, price reductions, co-opportunity advertising, uh, deduction management, um, all of it in one place. And so that gives you the executives, the ability to see everything from top down, analyze, understand their promotional efforts. Like for instance, we have a key account promotional uh, module that we just launched. And that's the ability to work with your key accounts with a three dimensional model, understanding everything on one page, all of the tactics of supply and demand. And then all together at the end, you get a full financial with a projected um, ROI calculator and, and, and numbers that are just happening as you add more tactics or reduce tactics. It's unlike anything else in the market. And that along with the ability to schedule demos or request demos from your reps, that's what we do. It's a full scale platform to manage your retail execution. Promo mash, Yuval's info, Matt's info, the good crisp. And if you didn't think, you thought I was joking. I mean, what am I? What is this guy doing over here? He's in the. I know, it's just sometimes you got to do it. I appreciate you guys. Uh, it was a good one. You take care, be well, be healthy. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye.